Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight we are continuing in our study of the book of Proverbs. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time uh, at chapter 20, verse 4. Uh, if you have not seen uh, the previous studies, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, Proverbs is a unique book in the Bible, though, in that you can actually start studying Proverbs at any point and you can really benefit. It doesn't, you don't necessarily have to have the context because it's a series of sayings. Uh, they're called, a lot of times when people say that, you've, that's a wise saying, they'll say that's a proverb. Uh, and sometimes the, the proverb itself could be uh, like one verse, it could be two or three verses, but it's a, it's a statement that uh, to teach us a lesson so that we can gain wisdom. And uh, all 31 chapters, you know, are full of these. And it's not a long, cohesive story like the rest of the Bible. Uh, so it is okay to study Proverbs out of context, but I, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, before we begin, let me ask uh, Brother Eric to introduce himself and say hello. Hello, everybody. It's me again, the homo. Back to you. By popular demand. <laughs> okay. All right. Bless all of you. Oh, okay. Take it. All right. So we'll go to uh, chapter 20, verse 4. And uh, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it in the KJV first. Uh, sometimes we read it and it's just clear cut and, and uh, we don't need any other translations or commentaries or anything else. Uh, and it, it's real easy to understand. But sometimes we'll read a verse and I'll say, I think it might be helpful to look at a commentary or another translation. The one I like to use for that purpose is the amplified version because it's really like reading a commentary on the verse. Okay, uh, chapter 20, ver uh, verse four says, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Now, that verse is not related to the verse before and the verse after, I don't think. I'm looking at all three of them. I see this is an example of a verse that stands alone. But uh, I'll read it one more time, then I'll ask you, Brother Eric, to comment on it. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore, shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. Brother? Brother Luke, that's a great way to start out the uh, video. Uh, hang out. Uh, I have a confession to make. I stopped broadcasting uh, my gospel broadcasting uh, business because of the cold weather. But tomorrow morning, first thing, I'm going to fire it back up, cold or not. Okay, back to you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you don't want me to call you sluggard eric you want me to think of you as brother eric not sluggard right well it does rhyme so i'll have to give you points for that <laughs> well, <laughs> i've always liked the word sluggard and uh it just means uh, uh lazy but uh uh it's like sloth, sloth and slothenly. Uh, that's another word we talked about. Er, I think last chapter that the, the word was being slothful, and, it, and slothful and sluggard. I think those are pretty much the same thing. But a sluggard, I think, probably comes from the root word slug, which would be like a snail, and that's something that's very slow, slow moving. I mean, almost doesn't move at all. And that's what a lazy person does is they just they just do nothing and and if you don't get up and do your plowing just because it's cold out you're not going to have a crop and you're going to end up being hungry uh, or relying on someone else to to take care of you because you were too lazy uh, so there are so many recurring themes in the book of proverbs um, Laziness is something that's been brought up several times before, and, and, and it'll, it'll continue to bring up 
you know, the problem of being a lazy person. Uh, and, it, and a lot of times in Proverbs, it, uh, that we'll have a contrast. I, I don't see it in this verse. It's just a statement. If you are lazy, too lazy to get up and do your work just because it's cold outside, don't expect to have any food. When the, when the, when the, the harvest is ready, you won't have a harvest because you didn't put in the work. And uh, it's, so um, that's the point. Uh, but a lot of times in Proverbs, it, it says the sloth, sluggard person will suffer hunger, whereas the diligent person will have plenty, something like that. It, it can, compares two principles, being lazy versus being diligent. The lazy person gets, you know, suffers. The diligent person is rewarded for his hard work. But I don't see that uh, comparison in this verse, but it is very common in, in the book of Proverbs to have that contrast. All right, before I move on to the next verse, brother, anything else? Let's go right ahead. Very good. Okay. All right. Uh, let me look at that in the Amplified. I want to see how the Amplified looks at the word sluggard. Uh, I think that it'll probably just say a lazy person, but I'm curious how they will translate it. Yeah, verse 4 in the Amplified says, The lazy man does not plow when the winter planting season arrives, so he begs at the next harvest and has nothing to reap. Yeah. Okay. Just what we thought. Back to the KJV and onward to verse 5. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Hmm, very interesting. All right, brother, teach me what that one means. Well, we've been uh, portraying this example many times. You've uh, uh, drilled me with the... 40 questions and you've gotten the truth out of me and uh, that's how that works okay back to you okay uh, yeah the uh, counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water uh, a, a, another recurring theme is uh, that if you are wise you will want to be counseled you're not going to be so proud that you don't want to listen to anybody because you know it all uh, so that's what it means by counsel uh, there's a verse that says a wise man has many counselors uh, you listen to a lot of people it doesn't mean just because you're listening to counsel that you gotta actually follow all their advice but you at least you consider it and that, that would be a wise thing to do. And so if counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So if you're wise, if, you're, if you have understanding and understand the value of counseling, then you will make the effort. Even though it's deep water, you'll, you'll make the effort to get it out, get to, to uh, get the information that you need from people, uh, get advice from people. I would say that I think that's how, what it. I take that, but I want to look at that in the Amplified because it may be completely opposite of what I just said. Verse 5. Um, a plan, a motive, wise counsel in the heart of a man is like water in a deep well, but a man of understanding draws it out. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty much in agreement. If you if you do have understanding, and a lot of times understanding, uh, the word knowledge, the word understanding, the word wisdom, uh, these are all interconnected. And if a man, man understands the value of, of uh, good advice, he will draw it out. He will go to someone and say, I need your counsel. He'll make, make the effort. Uh, brother, do you you think that's all correct or any, any discrepancies there? I think that's great. And I think uh, that can be uh, applied on many different uh, levels, maybe as many as seven. 
Maybe one of these days we'll discover the seven pillars of wisdom. Okay, back to you. <laughs> well, you got the seven pillars of wisdom and you got the seven thunders. You like that word seven, don't you? It's, you know, I don't know if you've ever studied numerology, uh, not as not as the occult people would study it, study it because in the occult, um, they, they do things like palmistry, numerology, horoscopes, you know, astrology. Uh, th that's very, those things are very common in the occult. And we're warned in the Bible to, to avoid those things. But um, uh, numbers do have significance in the Bible. And, and uh, the word, I won't go sidetrack too far into that, but the, 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 the basic meaning of a lot of different numbers, but the number seven represents perfection. And uh, so a, a number for God is seven, 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 because it's perfect. It's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and uh, all, all perfect. Okay, uh, so there's your seven the number you like. Have, have you, were, are you familiar with that? I assume you were. Yes, and that's a perfect example of how uh, drawing out wisdom counsel out of the heart of man. Uh, you just portrayed that example perfectly. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, brother. Okay, so um, now I'll we'll go back to the KJV. Look at verse 6. It says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Uh, let me read it again slowly, and then I'll ask you to uh, explain it to me. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Brother? Okay, so there's more people out there tooting their own horns then there are people that are just getting out there and getting the job done day after day after day. I liked, uh, I liked your, uh, it's a modern translation that you just gave us, but you're talking about the word faithful and you translated in your own words as getting the job done a person that's faithful is someone that's diligent they faithfully getting the job done instead of just as it says in the beginning of verse it says most men proclaim everyone his own goodness so they're all bragging about and thinking so highly of themselves and and uh but to find someone that's not just out there bragging but it's actually doing it it's like there's a saying, it's not in the Bible, but uh, it, it could very well be, uh, it's uh, well done is better than well said. Uh, and that's kind of what this is. Uh, there's some people they talk and they boast and they act and they want to talk about their goodness and the things that they do. And But then how often can you find a man that's faithful that's actually doing it? Brother? Very good, Brother Luke. Uh, it reminds me of what Jesus said. Be ye, don't just be hearers of the word, be ye doers of the word. What do you think about that one? <laughs> yeah, that applies too. Uh, so on one hand, you could hear and not do. And another, on the other hand, you could boast about things, just do a lot of talking, but there's no action behind it. All right, let me look at that in the Amplified to see what, how they phrase it. Verse 6, many a man proclaims his own loyalty and goodness, but who can find a faithful and trustworthy man? In other words, they're rare. They're rare. I have found that to be true in my own life. Uh, uh, I've... You know, I don't want to go off too far on this tangent because I've, I've talked about it numerous times and I don't want people to think of me as just like someone that's like complaining about things. But uh, 
G Jesus is is the we talked about a verse I think it was in, uh, in it was in Proverbs and says there is one who's more f faithful than a, than a brother and we're talking about how that's Jesus um, and uh, a verse says that uh, uh, even when we have no faith he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself in other words uh, even if we are not faithful, in other words, it could be we don't continue believing, we don't continue loving, we don't continue doing works and ministry. We're not faithful in any of that. But Jesus, he'll remain faithful to us because he cannot deny himself. That means he can't break his word, his promise. He can't lie. He said, uh, I will never leave you or forsake you. So you can you can take that as to the bank. It's a guarantee, uh, even though we are not that faithful to Jesus. And I'm sad to say we're not that faithful to each other. I've had, you know, I won't go into a list, of, but there's several people I've got to know on YouTube that become uh, some of my closest friends, but they're not faithful friends. And it's unfortunate. Uh, that's. Uh, it's a, been a hard lesson for me to, to learn from my experience here. And that's why this, this verse here, it makes me think of that. Uh, but who can find a faithful and trustworthy man, someone who's faithful? And I think of, I apply that to of being a faithful friend to someone. Brother? Absolutely, Brother Luke. Jesus Christ is that faithful friend and he empowers us through fellowship with one another to be faithful to each other okay yeah now i i've made uh several videos over the years um complaining about christians and and christianity christianity it is not Christianity. Do you see the difference? Christianity. Jesus is not named Jesus Christ. You may think this is a weird little distinction I'm making, but Christianity is not about Christ. It's about religion. And most of the people who fall under this umbrella of Christianity or Christendom is another word for it. They label themselves as a Christian of some kind. But almost all of them are not really biblical Christians. They are not Christians because you ask them, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? You'll find that almost all the people who identify as Christians will, will base their hope of heaven on their personal merit. They're going to say, well, yeah, I, I think I'm going to go to heaven or I'm not sure. I, I'm hoping to. And then the reason is because I'm a good person and, you know, I, I, I follow the golden rule and the Ten Commandments. And I go to church and I do this, I do that, I do this, I do that. They're basing it on them, their own ability, their own merit. And that's not what the Bible says. Uh, Christianity is. Christianity is a person that says, I'm going to heaven, not because of anything that I've done, but because of what Jesus has done. I, I, it's not because of what I do, it's because of what I believe. I believe in Jesus to be my Savior. And that's the difference between uh, a Christian and a Christian, or Christianity and Christianity. And so I've made some videos uh, making that distinction. But another video I talked about is that uh, uh, there are some basic reasons that people are apprehensive and uh, and uh, don't want to hear about Jesus. And there's, a, I think I said, the, here's the top five reasons people reject Christianity. You can watch that video for all five reasons, but I'll tell you just one of the reasons that came to my mind is hypocrisy. Now, we're talking about being a faithful friend, for example. Well, Jesus is faithful. He'll never let us down. But mankind, we're not Jesus. We're not perfect. We we fail every we fail each other. 
and and but and some people will say i would never be a christian because i know christians and they're all hypocrites true you know we all of us all of us christians we we have been hypocrites from time to time because we are not, still not perfect people so we have our shortcomings we, we, uh, but the point is you don't become a christian based upon how other christians are are, are in your judgment you become a Christian because of Christ. You see, even though you might think I'm a hypocrite or other people, Christians you know, are hypocrites, Jesus is not a hypocrite. Your faith is in Jesus. He's not a hypocrite. He is faithful. He is real. He is the real thing, not a hypocrite. All right, brother, before I go on, anything else? Oh, very good, brother Luke. And that's why it's so important for us to come together every day and wash each other's feet. And that means we forgive each other of our offenses towards one another. So we can maintain fellowship, which is so important to maintain that fellowship so we can get the gospel out effectively. Okay. Yeah, well said. Well said. Uh, um and, and that's, see, this, this broadcast we're doing right now, it's live. And I posted the link so that if you're watching, you can click on that link and join the broadcast, provided uh, that you do agree with the statement of faith, the core doctrines of Christianity. Uh, and, and the reason I, I invite uh, Brother Eric and everybody else to join is for fellowship. See, we're studying the Bible. Some people think that I'm teaching. I'm not teaching. I'm studying it along with Brother Eric, along with anybody else who wants to participate. I'll give you my thoughts, but guess what? I'm not omniscient. I'm not infallible. I can tell you my opinions and to tell you why I believe, see it a certain way, but I'm not here to dictate my, my, all my conclusions on you. As long as you agree with the statement of faith, these core doctrines, then uh, the other things, then we can discuss and learn from each other. But the primary reason for Eric and me getting together right now is fellowship. Fellowship can only take place between believers. Now, if, if someone does not believe in the core doctrines of Christianity, and then they are not a Christian, I can't have fellowship with them. I could have a friendship. Uh, I've got friends that I've known my whole life, and, and, and some of them, they don't agree with me on my faith, and but I can remain friends. But I can't have fellowship. Fellowship is between believers. And uh, that's why, Brother Eric, when you... When you said we forgive each other and we have fellowship together, uh, this fellowship is so important. Uh, he said, remember what he said? L love one another. Yes, it's very important. We don't take this fellowship lightly at all. Okay. Okay, let me move on here. Um, uh, the the next, I'll go back to the KJV and look at verse, I think we're on verse 7 now. The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Okay, brother, what, do you, what does that mean? Well, brother Luke, I would say the just man would be the man in Christ. Walking after your integrity would be walking in the spirit. And our children are blessed after us. There's nothing greater that we can offer our children than a godly heritage. Okay, back to you. Now, we, uh, we bring with us into every Bible study uh, are our basic beliefs. And we read the scriptures through a lens. Uh, 
and, and, and that, uh, that helps us understand it because the, the primary message of the Bible from the beginning to all the way through the end, it, it's about Jesus, our, our Savior God, and our need for him. And so um, when we read verses, the first thought that Brother Eric and I will get is we see it from that perspective, because that's the perspective we're bringing into the study. Uh, but there's there's other ways of understanding verses too that uh, maybe that uh, may be valid. Uh, and when I see the word just, a just man, uh, to me, I, I think that Brother Eric saw that and I thought a man that's justified, justified before God. The only way to be justified before God, that means that if God was to judge you and said, heaven or hell, which is it? And he, he, he's going to judge it. Well, you go to heaven, you, you're justified because of your faith in Jesus. You, you don't, you never put your faith in Jesus. You're not justified. That's how God justifies us based upon our faith in Jesus or lack of faith in Jesus. So when we see the just man, that's the perspective we're bringing into it. And that's the way that brother Eric answered the, 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 uh, the verse. But uh, another use of the word just uh, is, um, is that a person that is uh, applies justice. In other words, a person that's, let's say, their dealings in life are honest, fair, just. You know, they're not a liar, cheat, steal. They, they, they believe in justice, doing the right things. That's, that could be a definition of a just man also. Uh, it, it doesn't relate to salvation, but it relates to how some people are living their lives. They're, they're, they're trying to live a just life. And so if we look at it in that way, it says, um, the just man walketh in his, his integrity. So that means he walks, he lives his life with integrity and fairness and justice. And, and, and his children are blessed after him. Yeah, of course, uh, if, if that's the way you're living your life, uh, you know, your children will be blessed be, because you're, uh, you're being a good father. Part of that integrity and that justice that the man carries with him everywhere, it will affect his children and they will be blessed. Um, but when we look at the Bible in the whole context and we know that a man is only really considered just uh, when they put their faith in Jesus, then we really see the deeper meaning of that verse. Okay, brother, anything else before we move on? Oh, wow. I was thinking there may be as many as seven perspectives of that verse. And we have discovered the preeminent one as well as the most commonly uh, obvious one. <laughs> you love the number seven. I can see that. I'm going to look at it very quickly in the Amplified just to see how they phrase it. Amplified. Verse 7. Okay, verse 7. Um, it, it, it took the perspective basically that you did, brother, in your answer. It says the righteous man. Now, we know that a man is only righteous if the righteousness is imputed to him. See, when we put our faith in Jesus... Um, the God, Bible says that man's righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So our, my own righteousness has no value. It, it, it's like filthy rag. It's like dung. Yeah, but but there, I do have righteousness that was credited to me when I believed on Jesus. So when God looks at me right now, he sees a righteous man justified uh, because I believed in Jesus and so that's the way I see this translation here saying is the righteous man who walks in integrity and lives life in accord with his godly beliefs, how blessed and happy and spiritually secure are his children after him who have his example to follow. Now, I think that was beautifully stated, don't you? Yes, uh, I very much like that one. Okay. All right, I'll go on now back to the KJV, verse 8. Uh, 
Verse 8, a king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil with his eyes. Wow. Okay, let me tell you what that's about. Okay. The preeminent perspective on that one would be the millennial reign of Christ and how the lion and the lamb will lie down together. Okay, does that explain it to you? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't see that at all, brother. But uh, I can see. You see, I, again, as I said earlier, when we read the scriptures, we're bringing in our own um, 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 basic beliefs, the things that we our own doctrines, and we're seeing it through that lens. And uh, I don't, I don't hold that same position as you do about a millennial kingdom. I have a playlist titled uh, Dispensationalism, Millennialism, uh, uh, The Rapture, uh, all that. I can't remember the title, but it starts out with Dispensationalism, Millennialism. It's a, it's a lengthy study on that subject. And I did, I did hold to uh, Dispensational Futurism, a pre-tribulation rapture and a pre-millennial uh, return of Jesus and the thousand year literal literal reign. All those things, I, I agreed with that for 25 years. I taught it and I studied it and could, uh, you know, defend it. And over the last couple of years, though, I've studied other perspectives on that and I've been swayed. So I, I can't, I can't agree with you on that, but I can see, uh, now it says a king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil with his eyes. Uh, now, how did you say that relates to the millennial kingdom? Okay, now Jesus will reign a thousand years on earth on the seventh day, which we are, uh, if we're not in the seventh day, we're very close to the seventh day uh, of mankind. And uh, that's the rest and millennial reign of Christ, and he is that righteous king that's sitting on the throne of judgment and scattering away all the evil with his eyes because we know that peace will reign during that thousand years. Uh, but you uh, have found another uh, perspective that I'm not aware of. Uh, maybe we could discuss that sometime. Uh, yeah, I can go over and review it with you privately, but the, the best way, um, when, when I bring up a topic that is not um, the, um, what would I say, orthodox. See, the, the position that you, you are, have just described there is kind of the, it's the popular viewpoint today. Um, it's the majority opinion today in America. Around the world, that viewpoint Brother is not very well known or popular around the world, but in America, it's the primary viewpoint. Uh, that viewpoint became popular in the mid 1800s, and I did a um, I did a lengthy study and teaching on it to explain why I don't adhere to that any longer. So rather than try to explain it, I would just say watch my playlist titled Dispensationalism, and you'll you'll see why what I believe now and why. Uh, but uh, um, I want to look at that verse. Yeah. So brother, yeah, I, I can talk to you. I'll talk to you about it privately, or, or uh, you can just look at the playlist if you like. Uh, let me look at this in the Amplified. Uh, okay. Uh, Amplified says uh, verse eight. A discerning king who sits on the throne of judgment sifts all evil like chaff with his eyes and cannot be easily fooled. Well, that was more in line with the way that I saw the verse in the KJV. It's, it's talking about uh, uh, kings being able to discern and make judgments from their throne and uh, sifts, it says, sifts all evil like chaff. So a king is probably 
I mean, there were some foolish, uh, evil kings throughout history. But as this says, a discerning king. So if a, dis a king does have discernment, they will be able to discern and sift the chaff and, uh, with his eyes. He says he cannot be easily fooled. Uh, all right, let me, let me move on to the next verse. I'll go back to the, uh, the KJV. Okay, uh, this is verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Wow, brother. <laughs> what do you think? Okay. Uh, I think the uh, proverb is just threw that one in there. Just to teach you a lesson. <laughs> there can be only one perspective on that, and that would be the preeminent perspective of those who are in Christ. Okay, back to you. Uh, that statement is, is, that is a doctrine, a truth that is so essential for every person to learn and understand it's also not just in proverbs but it's 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 all throughout the new testament the the, the premise that none of us are pure we are all sinners and uh i think at first john it says uh, uh, um, if, if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, some people take 1 John 1, 9 to be that um, uh, after we're believers, uh, we, we've got every time we sin, we need to continually confess it and, and uh, uh, acknowledge our sin uh, all, all the time to God. But I don't see it that way at all. Uh, it says if, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, that's talking about a lost person. A lost person, the first thing they need to understand is, I am not worthy. Do you think you're gonna, you can go to heaven because you're worthy of it? You've done so much good and uh, you've done some bad things maybe, but not so bad and uh, you're, you're pretty darn good. So God will accept you in there into heaven. That's what most people think. But that verse is saying, if we say we have no sin, if, if we can't admit, that we're sinners we're in big trouble we've got to first acknowledge i'm a sinner and that's why i'm in trouble i can't go to heaven because of that that's when we realize that uh, wait a second i need help i can't do it on my own i need somebody to save me and as we study the bible we learn that the only one that can save us is jesus who is our savior god so the first thing we do is uh, we say we are a sinner. It says if we say we have no sin, well, I, I came to the conclusion, no, I, uh, I can admit it. Uh, I've sinned. And so that's why I need to put my faith in Jesus. He paid for my sins. And he says, if you trust me, I'll, I'll give you life everlasting. So I don't know how I got off on that. I don't remember what the verse said now, but let me see. It says, oh, yeah, who can say? I have made my heart clean. I am pure from my sin. Well, I can say that because of my faith in Jesus. But before I put my faith in Jesus, I could not say that. And if you have never put your faith in Jesus, then the question to you is, could you say that you have no sin, that you are pure? If you, if you do say that, Scripture says you're only deceiving yourself. Be honest with yourself admit that you have sinned now i know some people sin more than others and i know people have their different varieties of sins but it's not the number of sins and it's not the type of sin that's the issue the issue is are you a sinner at all if you've ever sinned you're a sinner and you are exempted from heaven and so that's why God became a man named Jesus and he came and died for our sins to resolve that problem. 
So thank Jesus. He died for our sins. It, sins are paid for. Now it's up to you to put your faith in him so you can receive life everlasting. Um, anything else before we go on, brother? Oh, yes, brother Luke. Jesus is the cure. The cure. Okay. Put your trust in him. Yes. You got to do something, right? You got to put, receive. Okay, back to you. All right. It, it was interesting. See, because uh, those people who are not that familiar with the Bible may not uh, appreciate what I'm saying right now, but the entire Bible is there's 66 books that, that are put together in under this umbrella that we call the Bible. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. And these books were all written by over 40 different writers. And it was written over a 1500 year span. And it was written on three different continents. And the writers were from all kinds of walks of life. Some were kings. Some were, one was a doctor and a historian. There were farmers. They were fishermen, people of all kinds. God spoke to them and they wrote this down for us. Uh, but as you read all the books of the Bible, you'll find out that uh, the Bible is a historical account. It's history. It's his story. History. It's his story. The story of Jesus. So um, as we read these books, we hear real historical accounts of, of real events and real people. But when we get to the book of Proverbs, it's not a historical account of, of, of things that have happened. It's, it's uh, uh, principles and ideas for us to learn to follow in our life so that we can be wise and be blessed. So um, I've got my telephone went off in the other room and the answering machine went off and somebody's leaving me a message now. So I'm distracted, <laughs> distracted by it. It's the devil, devil. Get behind me, Satan. Uh, so let me see. Um, that was the, oops, where am I now? The verse, um, I don't even remember why I, I went into that now. In verse 9, who can say I've made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. I got so distracted by that phone call, I forgot why I even said that last thing. Oh, yeah. The, this this verse seems to be there out of place. It doesn't seem to fit. But what you, you probably should have noticed by reading, let me see, verses 4 through 9. Uh, this is not uh, a series of verses that are cohesive in a story, telling us a story. Each verse basically stands alone on its own as a principle, as an idea for, for you to adapt, adopt into your life. But this one here is really particular, a, a, a blessing to Brother Eric and me, because as Christians, this is one of the basic premises of Christianity, admitting that we're a sinner and we're in a hopeless state and we need a savior. And the only savior is Jesus who, who died for our sins. So that's why this verse nine here, um, even though it doesn't seem to fit with the other verses, it stands out like a sore thumb to us in its importance. I'll, I'll go on brother, but what, anything else? I'm good, I'm good, okay. Okay, uh, let me go on here. This is verse, uh, verse 10 now, diverse weights, in diverse measures, both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. Brother? Okay, I think the uh, word diverse should uh, be representing um, faulty measurements. Diverse weights must mean faulty measurements, uh, measurements that aren't true. Because in the old days, they used scales to do business transactions. 
and some crooked uh, vendors would have divers weights. Okay, back to you. Yeah, so an abomination is something that God hates a lot. He doesn't just simply hate it, he extremely hates it, and that is being dishonest in your business dealings. And so the diverse ways, as you said, is uh, someone that is saying, comes to you and wants to buy some grain and you put it on your scale. And instead of being a true measurement, it's the scale is set to cheat them a little bit. And, and that's what this verse is saying. Don't be dishonest in your business dealings. God hates it. Okay. Now verse 11 even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. Hmm. Brother? Well, that's pretty obvious with the conventional perspective that that is true. The conventional perspective being the most obvious. Uh, uh, and we've all... Uh, uh, seen uh, children and uh, watched their behavior and pr probably everybody has noted that and can affirm that to be true. Okay, back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me see. The 12, verse 12, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. Brother? Okay, um, that's uh, the conventional perspective on that is very obvious and not much to say unless you have others' perspectives. There's got to be at least six more. Uh, I'm sure we could pull one or two other different perspectives out of there if we tried hard enough. All right, uh, it seems pretty clear, but that's why I'm going to look at it in the Amplified just to see if it uh, says anything different. So the hearing ear and the seeing eye the lord hath made both of them um well you could say the hearing and the seeing is that god did this miraculous miraculous creation that you know we are so designed and made in such a way that it's, it's really miraculous the way god has made us because our ears can hear things our eyes can see things uh the lord hath made both of them but you could also take it as the hearing ear and the seeing eye. That's the person that observes and, and paying attention and, and uh, you know, a person that's really paying attention instead of like in a fog in their life, you know. Uh, I'll read the, uh, the, oh, let me go back to the KJV. Okay, verse 13, love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. <laughs> Brother? Okay, the obvious first half of that verse uh, is quite obvious. Uh, because everybody knows the early bird catches the worm. Okay, but now the second half of that verse uh, is a little bit more trickier. Uh, but I would reconcile that to mean that uh, what you need, you've probably already got it. Just open your eyes and look around because God provides for his children. Okay, you don't need to be a high maintenance person. Because God can provide for you on a low maintenance level uh, abundantly. Okay, back to you. Hmm. Okay, let me read that again. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. That's like that verse we read earlier about the sluggard. It says that verse four: the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore, shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. So they're both talking about a, a lazy person. The sluggard won't won't go out in the cold and plow the this person here in uh verse 13 is just being lazy doesn't want to get out of bed and and if you if you're lazy and you won't plow you won't get out of bed you're going to be poor you're going to be starving and he said open thine eyes so in other words wake up and get out of bed 
and do something, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. So again, it's uh, it's just encouraging you to hey, be a diligent person. Don't be lazy. Your life is going to suffer if you're if you're not lazy. You're hard worker. Uh, your life's going to be a lot better off. It's pretty simple, but it's amazing that there's a lot of people that can't follow the, the, the a basic thing like that. Let's get up and get to work. Okay. Uh, oh man clicked in the wrong spot there I went to the chapter 19 for a second here okay uh, verse 14 I think this will be the last verse here it is not it is not saith the buyer but when he is gone his way then he boasteth <laughs> I love that one my brother, go ahead and tell, tell me what that means. Well, that's obviously describing a haggling interaction between a vendor and a buyer. Can you see that there? That's pretty obvious to me. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's like it's just being dishonest. It's like uh, you're... Uh, I mean, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, haggling and uh, doing a business transaction, negotiating or something that certain kind of things like that are, that's just part of it. And, and it's just, and it's acceptable. But uh, this is, this is not condoning it. And there's going to be other verses we're going to come to where we're going to find out that God doesn't condone that. It's just being dishonest. Like if you see a horse that's in perfect condition, and you and you try to haggle saying pick trying to pick things apart with a horse that's not really wrong but acting like something's wrong so you can try to get a better price for the horse you're not being honest and so i know that uh haggling is a very common thing but it, but it's uh you got to haggle in a way that at least be honest while you're haggling uh, negotiating i should say um all right well we're going to end it there let me see, that's just verse um, uh, verse 14. So I'm going to make a note here. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 15 is where we'll pick up next time. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to take a moment here. You know, the, the thing that we really end up doing in all these studies it doesn't matter which book of the bible we're studying it doesn't matter if there's some subject like early church history as we're studying it we cannot help but bring the gospel into all parts of it we've already been talking about it so much but uh, before we're finished i want to make sure you have a clear concise understanding of the gospel now, the gospel is a Greek word, and it simply means good news. So if I say, uh, have, have you heard the gospel? I'm saying, have you heard the good news? Well, to me, it should be translated as the greatest news. Because good news is, is not powerful enough. It's not, it's not good enough. What the news I'm going to tell you is the greatest news. Uh, there was a movie titled The Greatest Story Ever Told, and that's the story of salvation, and, uh, and it, it, it's a love story. So we, we talked earlier about understanding and admitting that we are sinners, we're not perfect. Now, the significance of that is then you can realize that you can't get into heaven, because to go to heaven, you can't have any sin at all. You have to be sinless. No sin is allowed in heaven. So if you've sinned a thousand times, if I've sinned 10,000 times, if Brother Eric sinned one time, even one is too much. We can't get in. You have to be perfect. That's the big problem that people don't understand. They think that you could be relatively good. Well, I'm better than that guy over there. That was what the Pharisee did when he was praying at the temple. 
and he and Jesus was observing. He said this Pharisee was praying and saying, "Oh, thank God, I'm not like these other people. I I fast and I give my alms and I pray. I do all these things. I'm not like these other people." And then there was another man, and he, all he did was fall on his face, and 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 he wouldn't even look up to heaven, and he just said, "God, have mercy on me, a sinner." You see the contrast between these two people. One was thought that he was really good and that God would love him and accept him. And the other one said, oh, I'm a sinner. Please have mercy on me, God. Jesus said it was the second man that would be justified, that would get to go to heaven. Uh, so the problem is most people are like the first man. They are trying to get to heaven uh, based upon their their own merit. They think that if they can be better than most people, God will say, oh, that's one of the better ones. You get in. But you've got to discard that idea. It's not biblical. The Bible says no one is righteous, not even one. It says go and be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. You've got to be perfect to get into heaven. And it, when you can admit that you're not perfect, then you can come to the conclusion that, well, I'm in trouble. I need to be saved. And that's what the Bible says is that uh, uh, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, the son of God, God manifest in the flesh, sent him to the world for on a mission. And the mission was to die for our sins because we, the man was in trouble. God came to our rescue. He died for our sins. And so now the sins are paid for. Now we can get into heaven, but we can only get in there by through faith in Jesus. You've got to put your faith in Jesus to receive life everlasting in heaven. So that's what we're asking you to do. Now, the reason that you can be confident that this is true and that it is certain is because of the resurrection of Jesus. The Jews... Um, that they didn't believe Jesus' claims. He said he came down from heaven. He says he's the son of God. He says he's going to die for the sins. And, and they, they didn't believe him. They said, well, give us a sign. And Jesus said, the only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the son of man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He was speaking about his death, burial, and resurrection. After he died on the cross, he was buried. He was dead in that tomb for three days and then raised from the dead. And he walked on the earth for 40 days. 500 witnesses saw him, the apostles, his brother James, and, and they touched him, they ate with him. That resurrection is the proof that Jesus is God and he has power over life and death. So you can be confident. If you put your faith in Jesus, your faith is justified. You can be confident that you're going to go to heaven because he proved himself with that resurrection. So that's what we're going to ask you to do now. If you've never done it before, reject the idea that you can work your way to heaven if you're a good person. Reject it. And instead, believe that Jesus is going to get you there because he died for your sins and he raised himself from the dead. He has power over life and death. He promises to give you life everlasting in heaven if you trust him. So believe that and you'll go to heaven. You're guaranteed. Brother, any last words before we uh, we close for the broadcast? Yeah, I would like to uh, admonish all your viewers to take your uh, advice and do receive that free gift of salvation it's very important that you do that today because jesus is the only way and it's very simple like brother luke said just put your full trust in the lord jesus christ and everyone is eligible everyone who can see and hear is eligible even if you can't see or hear, uh, we'll get the gospel to you somehow. And you can know for sure 
that you have eternal life. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, if you did put your faith in Jesus tonight, please make a comment on this video. I'd love to hear that. Uh, uh, join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time, and I uh, look forward to the next time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ. <laughs>